Good morning, a pleasant Sabbath. Are you hearing me clearly? No? It's better now? Yes, okay. First off, I want to welcome everyone to Sabbath service here with us, both our regular members and our visitors, as well as those who may be tuning in over the internet. Before we go into our devotion, we are going to have a word of prayer, so you can kneel. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Your word promises that any of us who are sad, any of us who may have a burden, any of us who are worried, that we can come to you. And the word promises us that anyone who comes to you in faith will not be cast aside. And so, Lord, with this assurance, we come this morning. We come because we recognize that without you, we are nothing. We come because we recognize that without you, we are lost. And Lord, it is our sincere desire that we may keep our souls. But even more importantly, Lord, that we may have a close experience with you. Because to have that experience is the highest joy there is. As we go into our brief devotion, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be in our midst. We ask, Lord, that you will take away anything that will distract us, anything, Lord, that may be weighing upon us. And as we listen to you, may our hearts be buoyed up. May the light that comes through this short devotion indeed, Lord, shine into our hearts and may it effect a transformation within us. These things we ask and thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, good morning again. Last week we started looking at the light and lessons that we may be able to learn from the light. And we said that Jesus is the light that came into the world. And that since in Romans it tells us that we can learn a lot about God from the things that appear in nature... We are looking in these few devotions at what lessons we can learn from the physical light that exists in our universe, things that can help us to understand he who is the true light that is supposed to light, er, lighten every man. This morning, we're going to be looking at sight, the miracle or the science of sight, and there are few lessons that we want to pull out to strengthen us even as we seek to have that closer relationship with God. So the miracle of sight is only possible because there is light in the universe. Without light, no creature would be able to see. And it is the same thing without Jesus who is the light. No creature would be able to adequately see God as he truly is. As a matter of fact, we are told that God dwells in light unapproachable. And yet through Jesus who was the light, that pure unapproachable light was distilled in a form and a fashion that finite creatures could comprehend and not only comprehend distantly, but interact with closely to be transformed by it. But it doesn't only take light for people to see, you also need eyes. And so today we're going to be looking at how the eye functions. Persons who are blind are not blind because there is an absence of light. Persons who are blind are blind because their eyes cannot receive or interpret the messages that are contained in the light that fills the entire world. And this is a powerful thought because it helps us to understand that spiritual blindness is not because God doesn't send light bright enough and clear enough that all may see, but because of an, an unwillingness or an inability for people to correctly grasp and interpret what is revealed in the light that God has sent to the earth. The miracle of sight, which depends so much on light, also depends, therefore, on the correct functioning of the eye and its several parts. And in the lessons that we are going to learn from the eyes and the parts of the eyes and how they operate, can also have or will also have the spiritual counterpart that will help us to understand Jesus who is the light and how we are to assimilate and work along with him to have the experience that he wants us to have. And so the first thing we're going to do is look to see what we can call our, the spiritual counterpart to the eye. And to do this, we're going to turn to Hebrews 11 and we're going to read verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1.
Okay, let's go. Now faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if we read that verse, what do you think then the I correspond to? Corresponds to? Anybody wants to hazard a guess? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, good. And after recounting the experiences of many of the faithful, further on in Hebrews 11, we are told that they all died, but they all saw the fulfillment of the promise from afar off. And it was through the eye of faith that they were able to see all that God wanted them to see and even to see what would be the end, the fulfillment of their trust and belief in him. So those who understand spiritual things know that physical sight, like every other pattern of the spiritual, is faulty. And therefore, we are not called to live our lives merely using the physical eye and physical light. We are called to live our lives using the spiritual eye of faith, so that we see as God sees, we understand as God understands. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, this is clearly seen because it says we ought to walk by faith rather than sight. So let us examine the natural eye and pull out some lessons that will help us to understand faith. Now, light enters the eye from an external source through a dome that is called the cornea. And the cornea is absolutely transparent. In persons who have cataract, however, this dome loses the transparency because of a buildup of protein in the eye. And as the cornea becomes increasingly cloudy, their vision becomes increasingly poorer. And this teaches us that faith has to be completely pure and completely transparent for us to truly understand and receive what God has for us. Anytime we allow ideas that we might have held before, anytime we allow traditions, anytime we allow history to be what we look at the light through, then this is the equivalent of having spiritual cataract. But God wants that we put everything out of the way when we approach him and approach his word so that as we read, it is only what he has for us that enters into the soul and not only that, that there is nothing that will distort or affect the way we perceive the truth that he has for us. Because we don't want the truth that he has to be blurred by anything. And this is also true when we receive the truth distilled through human eyes. And this may, what I'm going to say next may, be, may sound a little bit controversial, but it really isn't. It's just a simple point. Before Jesus came to the earth... God used holy men to communicate his truth to others. There's no disputing that. Yet, these men that were used by God were in many ways flawed because they were influenced by sin and because they're finite. So even if they were perfect, they still were finite. And it would have been difficult for them to communicate to other finite people infinite concepts about an infinite God. And so, although they were holy... Although they were converted, although they were saved, they had their limitations. And so when we are reading the word, we ought to always keep that at the back of our minds. In Hebrews, we are told that while God would have used these men in times of old, in these times, he uses one true witness, one clear source that we may appreciate what he is. And that one true light is Jesus and him alone. So if in these last days, Jesus is the only conduit through whom he is going to speak, and since he is the only one who really could receive all that God was to communicate it to us, then our primary focus and understanding of anything related to God has to be within the context of the witness that Jesus gives. We're told that in the final days, we don't overcome by the testimony of any other prophet, although they would have been good men. We overcome only by the testimony given to us of Jesus Christ. 
And so if we want to understand God as he truly is, the Old Testament, yes, there are fantastic stories that can encourage us along the way. But really and truly, the only understanding, true understanding, complete understanding that we can have of God is through Jesus. And this caused a problem to the Jews back then because they would have read in Isaiah where it says, according to the law and the prophets, if it speak not according to these things, there is no light in them. But Jesus, when he came, seemed to contradict so many of the things that they would have read in the scripture. So they were told an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And then Jesus came to tell them, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give them your coat, your cloak, your shoes, your everything. And so it would have caused a bit of dissonance, to use that word, in their minds. How can he say that he is from the Father, and yet we have these things written in Scripture, recorded by holy men, who says this is the way God wants us to live. So how can we reconcile this? So even in our lives today, we will find ourselves in situations where there appears to be some kind of a contradiction. Or sometimes you may read in the word and it appears to be a contradiction. But we have to understand that there really is no contradiction and that everything else that we read in scripture has to be interpreted through one source only, who is Jesus. And so our example for every moment's living our example for the decisions we are to make and the choices that we are to make in our day-to-day -day lives. Yes, we can have all of the Bible, but Jesus Christ in these last days is our perfect example. And it may be that that is why God has so much trouble perfecting a group of people because a lot of people are content with only the finite revelation of God. Because in the finite revelation of God, there is so much room to maneuver and operate as a selfish heart may desire to do so. But if we use Jesus as the ultimate pattern, and in every situation we ask ourselves, how would Jesus operate in this situation, then we have a a clarity that we cannot contradict, a clarity that cannot be gainsaid. And in those situations when we don't just look for a word, we look for the word, Christ, in the situation, then our lives become transformed into the, revel into the image of Jesus who is the only true pattern. And not comprehending this truth, as I said, is what affects so many people because they, they look for the wiggle room in the scriptures to be able to do as they please. So something there's something hard or unpleasant that we have to do. And we can find where, well, I don't, I'm not even sure if this is in scripture, but we often say God doesn't want fools in his kingdom because the word says that you must be as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. So we hide behind this thing about being as wise as a serpent. And if we consider what the serpent was in Genesis, if we're going to be as wise as that serpent, we're in serious trouble. Jesus, when he came, however, showed us that what is wisdom with the world, the world's way of operating, which may seem reasonable, is really not the way that we are to operate. He says the, the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, while the foolish things of the world are wisdom to God. So when you go beyond the call of duty, when you are willing to deny yourself at every opportunity, there may be those that will tell you, but that's really stupid. God doesn't want fools in his kingdom. You shouldn't do that or you shouldn't allow the people to do this to you or X or Y to you. But then when we put the same situation and put Jesus in that situation, we see where they came to Jesus and at every step of the way, Jesus never retaliated. At every step of the way, he did not answer them as they deserve to be answered by human reasoning. And so Jesus is the ultimate expression, the ultimate example. So I'm not saying don't read the other parts of the Bible, but I'm saying everything now, because if our corneas are to be clear, it can't have any trace of humanity in it, Everything that we see in the word, every thought that comes to us, every suggestion, Jesus must have cleared the eye of faith so that we receive it through him. That way we have the perfect picture, not a blurred or a dimmed picture. 
And if we go on, Jesus, after the light passes through the cornea, the next part of the eye it will enter is the pupil. And the pupil has the work of accommodation. So if we are in a dark room, the pupils will open wider to let in more light. But if outside is very bright, the pupil will narrow so that just enough light comes in to allow us to see. And I liken the pupil to the whole concept of surrender for the Christian. Because the degree to which you are willing to surrender to the light and allow it in is the degree to which you will be transformed by it. How many times in scripture we are told that people could not receive a saying because it was too hard for them? How many times in scripture did people say, go and talk to God and get the message and bring it back to us because we, we can't behold that brightness so we don't want it coming straight to us. All of this represents either our willingness to have our pupils open wide to receive the light or our unwillingness to receive it and so we narrow or we hold off from surrendering. So the word comes to us, no, you are to deny yourself in that situation. When that word comes, and it will come, do we open the pupils to surrender to that truth, or do we narrow the pupil and keep that truth out just so we are able to live the life that we want to live? God is calling on us to open our willingness. Let me use that word. Be so willing to surrender that our pupils can be opened wide to receive all the light that is possible. And Jesus, when he was here on earth, it says he could hold all the fullness of God. And we who are finite, while we may not be able to hold all, if we become completely filled, then that is our all. And that is the aim that God has. Not that we can hold everything that he is, but that everything that we are becomes everything that he is. So that our all is equivalent to his all because we are completely filled. So God wants us to surrender completely, not a part-way surrender and not a part-time surrender, but a permanent, complete, total, and absolute surrender to the truth that is found in the word. So as we open and receive the light and it comes in, it fills the whole being. And we become then perfect replicas of Jesus, who is the ultimate example. And then after passing the pupil, it travels through the lens. And the purpose of the lens is to adjust for focusing. So things that are far away, the lens will operate in such a way that it allows the image to fall on the retina. Things that are close, will, it again has to adjust for those things that are closer. And for people like me who wear glasses or those of you who, who are over 40, they say that that particular membrane over time loses its ability to adjust rapidly to far, far, away, um, far away objects and closer objects. And that's why after 40, you tend to need glasses. So that's the purpose of the lens, to focus so that if I look right here at the microphone, I can see it sharp and clear, but then if I look over there to the tree at the back through the door, I can also see that clearly. So the, the lens is responsible for the clarity of the picture that you have. And I'm going to liken that focusing to where we put our focus. If our focus is right here in front of our face, so we're, we're focusing on the things that are right around us. So we're focusing on our jobs, we're focusing on our homes. We're focusing on the problems that we're experiencing in this world. If that's the only focus that we have for our spiritual eye, then there is no way that we can advance in the Christian experience. What God wants us to do is to focus on the things that we can't see that are not close up. Focus on the eternal things. He wants us also to focus on his son. So as we read and focus on what we are told about Jesus and his life. As we contemplate heavenly things, as we think of, one, I wonder what heaven is going to be like. As we, we look at God and not just as a, a far off picture, but actually try to get into him, to, to understand him, to comprehend him. 
then when we have our lens, the lenses of our lives focused on these eternal realities, then those are the things that become real in our experience. Those are the things that become real to us. And so you will find that the challenges that we're facing, the decisions that we have to make, then they lose their significance. And you know we have that song, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his all of that. And so God calls on us to take our focus off the world. He calls on us to put our focus instead on Jesus and eternal realities. He, calls it, he wants us now to take our focus off the little things that irritate, the little things that bother us. And I have a child in my class who is autistic. And so if somebody sits in his seat, his whole world becomes wrapped up in the fact that there's somebody sitting in his seat. And he will throw a tantrum and he will get on. If I remember one time he was writing something and he, he made a mistake in one line. And all he could focus on was that one mistake and he could not figure out how to get past that. But the thing about him is that when he gets into those kinds of situations, once you distract him and put his focus somewhere else, in two tools he is, he's okay. But if you allow him to focus on it, he will actually fix it on that little tiny problem. And you can't get him to move past that. It is the same thing with us. So many times there are little annoyances in life. So many times there are little problems. But because our focus is there, they seem to fill all of our vision. And they seem to become the only thing that is in our life. And even people who, who get depressed and maybe looking at suicide, that's the main problem, that the problem that they are focusing on becomes so big and looms so large in their vision that they figure there is nothing else in life outside of this. And if we live our lives like this, as I said, we can never get beyond it. God wants us to take our focus off the world, whether it be the pleasures of the world whether it be the concerns and problems and cares of the world, and instead put them where there is hope, because there is no hope in these things down here. If we keep focusing, all right, let me say this thing first. Not that I'm saying that you should not be aware, but if our focus is only on what the Pope is doing, our focus is on the... Um, earthquakes that we're having. Our focus is on the disruptions in the Middle East. Our focus is on wonder who's going to be the next U.S. president. Our focus is on I wonder how I'm going to pay the next bill. Our focus is on all of these things. Then what we are doing is filling our whole being with despair and we lose sight of Jesus. And if our focus on the church is on those who we think aren't living the Christian life, if our focus in the church is on the leaders who we think aren't doing what God wants us to do, again, I'm saying not that you're not to be aware of these things, but where is your focus going to be? We need to take our focus off the things that are on this earth and put our focus instead on Jesus because it is only by focusing on him that we really can see that there is hope. There, it is only by focusing on him that we can become transformed because we are told that we are transformed by the things that we see. So if we desire the Christian life, the Christian life is in Christian there's Christ. So the Christian life is the life of Christ. So if we have a desire to experience the Christian life, then our focus has to be on Christ. And as we behold him, as we study him, as we fill our souls with him, then that becomes what is manifested outward to others. And next week, what we're going to do is to look at seeing colors, how we see colors and what lessons we can learn from that. But before we close this morning, there is one verse that we are going to all read together, which pretty much says what I want us to take away from the devotion this morning. And it's found in Matthew 6, verse 22. Matthew 6, verse 22. And we'll read it together. I 
And it's amazing because I've known that light exists, I guess, for as long as I've been alive. But it is only in, in looking at these things that I realize that when the Bible tells you that everything that is in nature, everything you see around you gives you a picture of God, I don't know, just, just looking at light and seeing how big and broad even a study of something as simple as light can be, it is so amazing. And it, if, we, if we can spend our time just looking at all the things that are in nature, everything we see in nature, and saying, what does this teach me about God? And open our minds to the Holy Spirit. God will show us so many things. And the more we see of this, the more we get to see that all of these things that exist in this earth, all of the problems and everything, they are really not important. They're not even real. The Bible tells us that, that the things that we see are temporal. They're not even real. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, which we'll read together, we'll read it then, and then I will close. So together, let's read Matthew 6, 22. The light, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And this is a promise that God has for us. That if our eye is single, if we pick one thing, because we can't focus on two things. If I focus on this, everything else becomes blurry. So if we focus on Jesus, every other thing in the universe fades away. It becomes blurry, unimportant, indistinguishable. And as we focus on Jesus, he becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. And as we see him and focus on him, the assurance is that we will be transformed into his image. So if that is our desire, to be transformed into the image of Jesus, here is the bedrock principle by which it happens. Our eye has to be single. Our eyes have to focus on him and him alone, that everything else, the world, its cares, its problems, our own abilities, all of those things, that they lose their focus, that we can actually be transformed by this. So my prayer is that as we go through this week, we'll remember this and keep our eyes single so that the whole body, the whole character can be filled with the light of Jesus Christ. We'll pray to close. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for sending Jesus to be the light. We pray, Lord, that the words contained in the text which says our eyes are to be single will become our experience. We know that we are far away from this because the cares of the world, the problems, sometimes even the joys and the wonderful experiences, they become our focus so often that we do not truly see you continuously. And it is because of this, Lord, that we are overthrown so often by the enemy. May our eyes be single, focused solely on you and on the re eternal realities so that as we focus on these things, our lives will be transformed and we actually live in the experience of eternity. We ask that you will forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our waywardness, forgive us, Lord, of not being willing to open our pupils to receive all of the light and rejecting those things that don't align with what we prefer. Forgive us for these things, Lord. And as we submit and surrender to you, we ask that you will not cease until you have perfectly reproduced your character in our lives. And as we receive this revelation, and as we are transformed by it, may it shine out of our souls to others who are still in darkness, that they too may come to the light to be revived. Continue to be with everything that is said and done here today, and may your Holy Spirit reign in each heart, so that truly today will be a wonderful sitting. And may we take our focus off of others and focus on Jesus so that as we focus on him, our own deficiencies will be brought to our attention and not only brought to our attention, but because we are focusing on the light and allowing it in, may the light dispel them all so that we become perfect reflections of who Jesus is. These things we ask and thank you for in his name with thanksgiving. Amen.